Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am John DeWitt. I manage the Social Science Data Analysis Network at the University of Michigan's Population Study Center. Uh, we're excited to bring you today's presentation on graduate programs in the population sciences as part of our PIPS uh, webinar series. Before we get started, I just want to cover uh, a few quick items. First, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please use the chat panel, which likely appears on the uh, top or on the right of your screen, uh, to send me a message. Uh, also, the speakers have planned to reserve some time at the very end of the presentation for some questions, so please feel free to use the Q&A panel, uh, which should be at the bottom right to send us your questions. You can do so at any time, but we will hold off uh, until later in the session to answer those questions. Uh, I'd also like to give just a little bit of background information on my organization. Uh, this webinar is part of the Programs in the Population Sciences Project at the Social Science Data Analysis Network at the University of Michigan. Uh, we are housed within the Population Studies Center at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research. You will hear a little bit more about uh, the Population Studies Center and U of M a little bit later. Uh, but um, back to us, uh, although some of the webinars and workshops that we put on are aimed at instructors, uh, PIPS is really a resource for both instructors and their students who, um, uh, sorry, uh, PIPS is a resource for, for both uh, instructors and their students who may be interested in pursuing uh, graduate studies or careers in the population sciences. Uh, we've highlighted various graduate programs available and information on how to apply to those programs uh, on our PIPS website. We also post deadlines and links uh, for the graduate programs, uh, some of which will be discussed today, and a range of relevant internships and entry-level positions. Uh, that website is at pips.ssdan.net. Uh, and PIPS is part of a larger program called the Social Science Data Analysis Network uh, at, at Michigan. Uh, we, we tend to re just refer to it for sh uh, in short as SSDAN, and SSDAN was started in the mid-1990s by Director William Fry, uh, a prof professor at the University of Michigan, and who is now also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. SSDAN aims to make data more accessible for use in education, uh, especially at the undergraduate level. We also promote graduate studies and careers in the population sciences. Uh, that brings me to why we're so eager to host a webinar uh, with today's panelists. As you'll see, they re represent four stellar population centers and graduate training programs. Each has a slight variation on, uh, on their programs, things like how to apply. Some universities, for example, have demography departments, other universities require prospective students to apply for studies in departments such as sociology or economics. Uh, for each member of those teams uh, or of those centers here today, uh, we have Professor Matthew Hall from Cornell University, the Cornell Population Center. Professor Jenna Nobles, who is from the Center for Demography and Ecology at the University of Wisconsin. Professor Paula Fomby at the University of Michigan's Population Studies Center and Professor Wendy Manning from the Center for Family and Demographic Research at Bowling Green State University. I'd like to thank all of our excellent speakers today uh, for taking the time to present their centers. And with that, I will turn things over to Professor Matthew Hall from Cornell. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here to talk about the Cornell uh, Population Program. Um, the Cornell the uh, Cornell Population Center and population training at, at Cornell is, is probably a little younger than some of the other programs, but um, I think is, is uh, quite unique in, in some um, important ways, and I want to kind of discuss some of those with you and kind of give an overview of the program and talk a little bit about uh, its features. So uh, CPC is um, the, the, the hub of kind of uh, population or demographic work on, on campus here at Cornell. Uh, Cornell, if you're not familiar, is in upstate New York in, in uh, Ithaca um, and is um, a part of uh, Cornell University that is both kind of uh, is, is a private Ivy League university but is also a, um, uh, one of the uh, land-grant universities for the state of New York. So there's both a kind of a public and a private side. 
to Cornell and, and uh, the CPC sits on the public side and has a, a, a major kind of extension and land grant mission as part of it. Oops. So, um, like I said, CPC and uh, the, the demography program at, at Cornell is the center of all demographic research here. Um, the, I think what makes CPC and, and de demography training at Cornell particularly unique is that it is, um, is truly multidisciplinary. And so um, we have a range of affiliates, both faculty and students, from, from over 20 departments, but there's really core um, involvement from lots of lots of departments on campus, including um, a lot of collaboration and, and alignment in sociology um, and economics and uh, development sociology, which is um, uh, our kind of rural sociology department. Um, the program has kind of developed deep strengths in, in social demography and some strengths in formal demography, but we're particularly strong in these four areas that I have listed here on the slide. That is uh, poverty, poverty and inequality, and that includes a lot of work in um, kind of social stratification, social class dynamics, social mobility, also um, um, a good uh, range of uh, work on, um, on educational attainment and educational mobility and educational um, inequality. We also have a, um, a large group of people that are focused on health disparities and health behaviors. There's Cornell and, and the program that I'm affiliated with, uh, uh, PAM, or Policy Analysis and Management, is, um, is home to a large number of health economists, and, and many of those, including uh, John Colley and Sean Nicholson um, and Don Kinkle, are all um, affiliated with the program. And there's, a, there's a, another center of this focus on health behaviors and disparities that's connected to, the, connected to CPC. Um, my own research is focused on immigration and issues related to kind of racial and ethnic inequality, and so this kind of falls in this third bucket that um, includes work by lots of people on campus on topics related to undocumented migration, on immigration enforcement, on kind of the rise of uh, new immigration boom towns throughout the kind of the Midwest and the Great Plains, um, and then broader issues related to kind of what has uh, both kind of the causes and the consequences of population diversity. Um, and included here is a lot of focus on the kind of the, the causes and the consequences of residential segregation. Um, and then we also have, perhaps we're probably best known for our, um, our strong um, research strength in, in family demography, and so we have lots of scholars that are focused on issues related to um, uh, family formation, uh, marriage and cohabitation, on relationships, and also the kind of the interaction between families and children in institutions such as the criminal justice system or schools or neighborhoods. So I've, um, you know, we have uh, an enormous number of faculty that you can see on our webpage, um, cpc.cornell.edu, um, but I've kind of highlighted a few people that represent these strengths across the, across the disciplines um, and that um, are, are, you know, very tightly connected with, with CPC. And so I just want to uh, um, mention a few names, the first person off the the top left corner there is Kelly Music. She's the director of the of the program. Chris Wildeman is a, a sociologist, and he's um, the associate director of the program. Um, Parfait, just to the right of him, is is another associate director and is the chair of the rural sociology department. And then the rest of the people are, um, you know, uh, are are uh, faculty affiliates that are across sociology and economics and and my department, policy analysis and management, which is kind of the public policy. Uh, unit on campus. So, you know, CPC provides a lot of different resources and services for both students and faculty. Um, you know, part of a, a well-functioning POP Center is um, includes kind of access to data and computing services, and, and CPC, like all the other POP Centers uh, we're going to talk about, have a strong infrastructure and foundation in, in computing. And, and at Cornell, that's um, that is is through what's called Sizer, and this is our kind of data and um, computing center that is part of CPC. Um, and so they provide access to you know all the software that you would need, provide um, computing uh, uh, capabilities, also data archiving. We also have um, a an on-campus census data research center, an RDC, which is um, which provides access to to confidential census data, um, 
and is a, is a very secure environment that um, allows for students to ask questions that would usually require um, uh, you know, commuting to one of the, the census headquarters. Um, because of the university's mission as part of a land-grant university, we also have very strong connections to local and state agencies. Cornell actually, through this, the program on applied demographics, does um, the population projections and estimates for the state. Um, and we work regularly with, with uh, different organizations throughout the state on um, providing up-to-date up information on kind of local patterns and trends in, in uh, demographic uh, issues. Um, we also try to act as kind of the, the hub of population science for the entire upstate area. And so we host a, an upstate conference every year where uh, students and, and faculty from Syracuse, from SUNY Albany, from Buffalo, from other uh, campuses that are interested in um, population science come together and, and, and share research. Um, as, part of the CPC, as part of CPC, we also have a, you know, a, a running uh, seminar series where we bring in kind of world-class uh, world scholars. Uh, uh, Professor Nobles, who you'll hear from later, was actually just out here a couple weeks ago. And you can see on the left there, we have another great set of speakers coming in this coming spring. We also organize um, lots of major conferences on demographic issues. This conference, um, Criminalizing Immigrants, that's taking place next week is actually one that I've helped co-organize. And, and this is something that, that CPC runs and, and um, is, is um, one of the kind of the major efforts um, that CPC uh, organizes and, and is uh, closely involved or has uh, tight involvement with students. So let me talk a little bit about the training program here. Um, the training at, at CPC is, um, is, is robust in its, in its coordinated efforts to bring students and faculty together. So there are lots of opportunities for students to develop research with faculty. Um, there's uh, opportunities to work on funded projects, but there's also broader opportunities to work in, in, with, um, on faculty research and uh, across a range of topics. CPC uh, affiliates have a strong uh, track record of working with students, on publishing with students. Um, and there's, there really are kind of a, a large and growing number of classes on campus that are focused on demographic topics. So just this year, this is kind of a, a selective set of classes. It doesn't even feature all of them. You can see that we're offering classes on family demography, on spatial demography, on gender inequality, um, on causal reasoning. We have lots of classes on causal analysis here. Um, social inequality, neighborhoods and schools, education policy, sequence and network uh, analysis and network sampling. Um, I uh, offer a class in immigrant incorporation, uh, health disparities, um, urban inequality. This is not even the complete set of classes that are offered for graduate students this year, but represents some of the, um, some of those and kind of the, the broad reach that, that CPC uh, has across campus. So the actual training itself is run through a uh, minor in demography. We don't have, there's no Department of Demography at Cornell. We don't um, currently have a, a dual degree program like some other places have, but we, we operate, um, the, the training runs through the minor program that, that I help to uh, coordinate. And um, any social science PhD student on campus has access to this minor, and we actually have students from, um, you know, from nutrition and from city and regional planning. Um, and um, even anthropology, but are kind of the, the core disciplines that are that are represented in in the uh, training program are sociology, um, policy analysis and management. That's PAM, um, econ, and, and DSOCE, which is the development sociology program. And so the way that the application process works is that when students are admitted into one of those programs, they can um, participate or enroll in the minor program. Um, the program itself is centered around kind of both substance and method, and that the, it requires a, a class in kind of the, the principles of demography that's taught every year by Dan Lichter, um, another class on demographic techniques by, uh, by Chris Wildeman, um, and, then, and then I run a kind of bi-weekly pro seminar series that focuses on professionalization and methods development, um, and then, um, you know, uh, an, an elective class that, that can choose from a large set of those classes that we saw on our last slide. Um, there's lots of funding opportunities for students um, as part of the minor, um, and then we also offer both kind of preparation and training and, and funding for, for major conferences, particularly 
you know, the, the PAA um, Population Association of America uh, conference. So I just want to wrap up there and uh, let you know that if you have any questions about the program itself, about how to actually apply to any of the departments at Cornell, um, I'm happy to answer those questions or help kind of try to navigate you through the process. And you can reach me at the email there, mhall at cornell.edu. So I look forward to hearing any questions you might have. Um, and I'm going to pass it off now. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Matthew Hall. Uh, we will, um, please, as he mentioned, uh, please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A panel on the bottom, and we can hold those until the end, but it's, uh, you're, you're perfectly acceptable to ask the questions now. Uh, and with that, we'll turn things over to Professor Jenna Nobles of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's uh, Center for Demography and Ecology. Okay, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenna Nobles. Uh, I am uh, an associate professor of Sociology and Population Health Sciences at Wisconsin, and um, in this fortunate position to be the training director for the Center for Demography and Ecology. At Wisconsin, we have two centers that we think of as sister centers because we run a training program that is jointly draws from the strengths of both centers. Um, the first is funded by NICHD, our Center for Demography and Ecology, and the second is our Center for Demography of Health and Aging that's funded by the National Institutes for Aging. We're one of only a few, institute, uh, few institutions in the country that has both a population and an aging center, and it's one of the real strengths of, of our program. We are uh, one of the oldest and largest training centers in the country. Um, We've been supported continuously by NIH since uh, about the time these centers were founded. So CDE was founded in 1962. Since then, we've trained over 300 PhD students, including some of the most esteemed practitioners of population science, <laughs> two of whom you're gonna hear from in just a few minutes, uh, both uh, Wendy and, and Paula. And uh, we had our 50th anniversary a few years ago, and you can see that a, a large number of people from all over the country and, frankly, all over the world have come through the center at some point in time. And so one of the joys and the strengths of this program is the network connections to this enormous alumni base that has come out of Wisconsin over the years. Right now, we've grown from what was a you know, very small center in the 1960s to a huge multidisciplinary center at this point. And so we are, are now 71 faculty from 17 different departments and centers from across campus. Um, as you can imagine, the range of scholarship is vast, <laughs> but we uh, are particularly strong in five areas. Um, inequality, fertility, families, and households, health and the life course, biodemography, and environmental and spatial demography. Our biodemography is, has strong links to both the med school here, uh, as well as uh, various departments like population health sciences, OBGYN, um, uh, biology and study of the microbiome, genetics and study of bioinformatics. Our environmental and spatial demography draws on the Nelson Institute for environmental science here, as well as the Applied Population Lab, which is a laboratory engaged with what it sounds like, applied population research. So how do we think about what's going on in the U.S. right now? So just to give you a, a, a little sense of the range of some of the things that happens here, I'll just highlight a few of the projects that are currently uh, have active funding and, and their PIs. So Felix Elwert is uh, one of the actually world's leading experts in methods for causal inference. And he asks questions like how community traits like poverty and schooling impact individual well being, the well being of children, and the well being of grandchildren. Pam Hurd is the PI of the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, a study that has been following graduates of the high school class of 1957. Uh, for many, many, many years. And this is a fascinating study that incorporates both genetic data and now um, data on gut microbiome. So Pam and the team of people affiliated with the WLS, including all of her students, are able to ask questions about how social exposures interact with genetics and microbiota to shape healthy aging. 
Benabado asks how debt and bankruptcy drive inequality in family well-being. She studies how wealth inequality is produced over time and across generations. Catherine Curtis is the director of the Applied Population Lab, and Catherine focuses on things like how sea level rise affects migration and how families respond to natural disaster. She uh, and her students are closely tied um, with scholars in the Nelson, study, uh, the Nelson Center for Environmental Studies. Alberto Poloni uh, has ongoing data collection efforts, including um, ongoing uh, big funded grants through NIH to study how early life conditions shape human health throughout the life course. And this is something that a number of our students have become actively engaged with. Um, and if you're interested in Latin American mortality, uh, CDE hosts the Lambda website. Marcy Carlson, our current director, um, is one of the country's leading experts on how family formation and dissolution shape child development and well-being, and how fathering in the U.S. has changed over the last half century. So this is a you know, very small slice of the scope of, of projects that are done here. And all of our incoming students have the opportunity to collaborate with faculty members that they're interested in working with uh, at some point in time in, their, in the program. And most of our students actually ultimately decide to collaborate with several of the faculty during their time here, which offers the opportunity to develop a diverse set of, of research interests um, while, while you're at Wisconsin. So one of the strengths of the program is really the um, size and scope of the research that's, that's produced. We currently have 41 PhD students from seven disciplines. Um, these are listed here. And entry into, uh, the entry into being a pre-doctoral research affiliate of the CDE or the CDHA actually in, is initiated by applying to a degree program. And then some people indicate in their application that they'd like to become affiliates right away. Others enter our program by attending seminars and deciding that this feels like a good intellectual home um, by meeting faculty they're interested in working with and learning about resources that are offered. And so we, we actually have people join as our PhD students you know, from the day they're admitted to um, all the way up to the, you know, the end of their degree training program. Um, I wanted to mention too that we have several joint degree programs for interested students that are run partially through our centers. So for example, it's possible to get a PhD in sociology and an MS in population health. It's actually possible to do it vice versa. We have a student graduating this year with joint degrees in political science and economics. And so it, it's possible to combine interests in a way that uh, both result in not only diverse research trajectories, but also um, multiple sets of degrees if that's of, of interest. Okay, our training program is, I would guess, structured like some of the other uh, programs that you'll hear about today. We have a weekly seminar series. Um, we bring in people from around the country and, and actually uh, this year are able to bring in a few people uh, internationally as well. Our students always meet with these visitors. Um, we have a weekly professional development training uh, seminar, and this includes things like how do you write grants, how do you apply for a job, how do you give a good talk, um, as well as how do you do improve your data visualization skills in R, how do you develop some new skills in, in network programming. We actively encourage our students to travel and participate in conferences, and we fund support to go to the annual meetings of the Population Association of America. Um, all of our pre-doctoral students have ongoing joint research with faculty members. Often this is multiple faculty members. Students typically maintain their own research agenda as well, but we really emphasize the um, apprenticeship aspect of research development in the first couple of years in the program. So when students are in their first and second year, our goal is to have them learning the craft of research alongside a faculty member. And then as students advance through the program, they tend to develop their own research interests and, and take those skills and run with them. Um, still with that faculty guidance, but not necessarily um, so tightly uh, co-authored work. Like the other centers you'll hear from today, we have strong statistical and computing support, including high throughput computing, um, we have a great data access support. 
and grant writing support through our, our academic and our academic staff. Um, one of the nice features of being at Wisconsin is that we have a Census Bureau Restricted Data Center right on campus, and that has been a real resource for people because it's possible to um, access really unusual and high resolution administrative data one floor below your office. <laughs> so people have really enjoyed having access to that and its proximity. Um, we also have a number of ongoing major data collection initiatives like the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, like MIDAS, um, like the Study for Health of Wisconsin, as well as uh, several others. And these allow students to have the opportunity to be engaged in data collection uh, as it's being developed. Um, as Matt mentioned, you know, we teach a, a variety of courses. This is just a subset of the courses taught in the last year. So advanced demographic techniques, causal inference, biodemography, networks and social science, Bayesian statistics and methodology, quasi-experimental design, aging in the life course, family and fertility, poverty and policy, and migration and migrants. And so it's possible to go, both get strong training and substantive interests and a diverse array of methodological skills. Our students who are working in epigenetics or um, with microbiotic data often take courses in um, bioinformatics, genetics, and biology, in addition to the, the kinds of courses that you see here. Um, we have great success at, at placing our students, as is evidenced by um, the you know, exemplary scholars that you get to hear from in a few minutes. Uh, in the last five years, our graduates have taken postdocs or faculty positions at Columbia, Cornell, Arizona, Michigan, and Minnesota, um, as well as research positions at Mathematica, RAND, the National Center for Health Statistics, and the Population Reference Bureau. And this is just a subset of, of our graduates in the last five years. And so it's possible to come here if one is interested in an academic position or a non-academic position. We really try to tailor our training to uh, have students ready to do either kind of position um, for some students who aren't interested in the academy specifically. I wanted to briefly mention that we there are a number of features of Madison that we love quite a bit. And so one of the things that we really enjoy is that this is the state capital. And for that reason, some of our students who are interested in being doing applied work and being connected to policymakers have a direct access to do that. There is literally a street that runs from the capital to campus. Um, this is also a place to be if you love being outdoors. The campus is situated on a big lake. Um, there are bike paths that can take you all the way to Iowa. <laughs> and finally, um, this is also a, a series of centers that are organized around a vibrant social life. So we all, this is a very collegial place to be. People enjoy being together. People enjoy um, things like the many delicious uh, restaurants and, and pubs in town as well. The final thing I'll say is that our websites contain a bunch of information on uh, our programs, and you can find those here, ssc.wisc.edu slash cde or slash cdha. Um, I am more than happy to help with questions or information if you're interested in applying to programs or becoming affiliated with the centers or thinking about how you might get started in population science. And my email is jnoble at ssc.wisc.edu. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That is excellent information. I'm glad I learned a few things uh, as well about the University of Wisconsin and, uh, and, and some of those particular draws to Madison as well. Um, uh, so we are ready to move on to uh, a center that I know uh, fairly well at the University of Michigan, the Population Studies Center. So we should have uh, Paula Fomby, who is joining us, and um, so as, as you may have noticed, uh, the Population Studies Center is actually the home center of PIPS and the Social Science Data Analysis Network, uh, and uh, we have Professor Paula Fomby uh, available to talk a little bit more about uh, PSC. Okay, thank you, John. Thanks for the opportunity, and thanks to everyone for attending today. I'm happy to have a chance to talk about the Population Study Center here at Michigan. 
so the Population Studies Center is a, the nation's oldest active population center for research and training in population studies. It started in 1961. And in, it's unique in some ways that, in that rather than being housed in an academic department or across academic departments, it's housed in the university's Institute for Social Research which, has a, which is a national leader in large-scale survey and administrative data collection and analysis. And that location, I think, has a lot to do with that shaping the graduate students who are affiliated with the Pop Studies Center here. PSC includes uh, nearly 100 faculty training affiliates spread across a variety of departments and programs on campus. So although the POP Center is located in the institution, Institute for Social Research, our faculty are affiliated with a variety of programs, including sociology, economics, public health, anthropology. We have affiliates in the medical school. So it's really broadly interdisciplinary. And similarly to Wisconsin's model, our training program is supported by two uh, funders in the National Institutes of Health one focused on child health and human development, and another focused on population aging. So our training model and our faculty are well equipped to really provide training in population sciences across the life course. The, uh, the training program at the Population Studies Center is a rooted, a, is a, rooted in several academic departments that I'll uh, enumerate in a moment, and our goals in administering the training program are to be able to complement the really rigorous disciplinary training that you get in a home academic unit by exposing our students to broad knowledge in population studies and then endowing them with strong skills in statistical and demographic techniques so that they're eventually able to undertake their own research on a variety of population topics, going from uh, thinking about fertility and migration, uh, population change, composition change, uh, migra uh, changes in urbanicity, thinking of mortality. We have people working in all of these areas, and we have students involved, actively involved in all of those areas at the moment. And we achieve these, the training goals by through the strong faculty and student presence we have in all of the associated academic units. Uh, through the, similarly to what Jenna was describing, a strong training apprenticeship model with our affiliated faculty. And then that's complemented by informal seminars and discussion groups, both in the Population Studies Center and in the academic units that are affiliated with the center. And then through students' own formal coursework in their academic units. And the PSC training program offers students tuition coverage, stipend, and health insurance for up to three years. And our students typically complement that those years of coverage with research or teaching appointments in their home department in the off years. Like, uh, like Cornell and Wisconsin, we're able to provide substantial infrastructure and administrative support in addition to financial support. We offer students workspace computing support, including a, a research, a, a data research center uh, through the Census Bureau that's available here. We have library and information services to help with, uh, with literature searches. And we also provide a variety of other data services and support in developing IRB applications for your own, uh, for your own independent research, whether that's secondary data analysis or you're doing your own data collection. We're also able to subsidize students' attendance at the Population Association of America's annual meeting to present research and to learn about other research happening in the field. And I'll just mention that PSC is not a degree-granting program in itself, but it's an administrative structure for providing training to students housed in academic units. And so the PSC-affiliated academic programs on campus are economics and sociology, which are in the uh, College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Health behavior and health education is one, pro one department in the public health school. That's a bit different from the other programs that uh, PSC is affiliated with because it primarily admits students to the PhD program 
who already hold a master's in public health. And then we also have students who are enrolled in the public policy program through the Ford School. So the PhD program in the, in the public policy school is a joint degree program. And so students who, all students there and PSD affiliates there also have joint uh, appointments in sociology and economics. So when you earn a degree through that public policy joint degree program, you get degrees uh, in policy as well as another discipline. So the, to review the training opportunities that I described, that are summarized briefly, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about those. I mentioned that one part, of one leg of the training model is formal coursework. And so across the various departments that PSD is affiliated with, students get disciplinary specific training in quantitative methods and research methods and, and the theory that the strongly associated with those disciplines, whether it's sociology or economics or epidemiology. And in addition, in addition students take training in uh, cognate courses and electives in topical courses that may be of interest to population scholars, including coursework on immigration, race and ethnicity, health, medical care. Uh, students in all departments take qualifying exams as part of their, uh, as part of their training and complete third year papers or uh, seminar papers showing original research on as they're making progress toward completing their dissertation. And so the, all, the, that model is fairly consistent across all of the academic units that I described. And then the goal with PSC is to be able to provide a kind of frame for approaching population scholarship in a discipline specific way, but one that enables you to be conversant with population scholars across disciplines as well. And we achieve that in part through the workshops and seminars that are organized both by PSC and they're organized by population scholars in our various affiliated academic units. So PSC offers a brown bag seminar throughout the academic year. We bring in inter internal as well as visiting speakers presenting their original research. This year we're taking a new approach and offering a set of mini series on uh, two topics. One will be on, to on the question of whether families are becoming more complex and our next speaker will be one of the guests in that series. So we'll have, in, just as an example, we'll have three speakers in on different weeks addressing that question. And then in the fourth week, we'll have student-led discussions about what they learned from the three different perspectives presented by the speakers. And students will have an opportunity to interact with the speakers both during their presentations and informally afterwards to prepare themselves to lead a sort of thoughtful, critical discussion of what they've learned from this from the variety of perspectives presented to them in the preceding weeks. And then in addition, there are a variety of seminars and working groups that are housed in different academic units, but that are accessible to students across campus. So just to give you a, a sense of the flavor of those, sociology has a program for its graduate students on the broad topic of inequality, demography, and family. And each week, students present their, their, their works in progress. In, in, in those areas of interest. Economics has a program called H2D2, which stands for Health, History, Demography, and Development. And P Public Health has a series on social epidemiology and population health. And, there are many, and beyond that, there are many others, and I'm happy to follow up with a list for anyone who might be interested. And then finally, our apprenticeship model provides hands-on training working with research active faculty who are really at the forefront of population science. So our trainees work with, with, with their uh, faculty mentors for 12 hours a week, and they move up from ramping up from learning data manipulation and data management techniques with their, uh, under their mentor's guidance to eventually co-authoring or leading research manuscripts. Most apprenticeships result in one or more publications with trainee authors, either as co-authors or lead authors. And during their time here, most of our trainees work with two or more mentors, which gives them training in a variety of areas, and gives a sense of the different approaches that scholars take to the, uh, conducting population science. 
I think some of the things that are most exciting at PSC now and that make Michigan a particularly attractive place to pursue training in population science are one, uh, the one that I mentioned at the outset is that because PSC is housed at the Institute for Social Research, our students are exposed to ongoing and new data collection on topics in demography in the U.S. and internationally. So you're able to really work hands-on with seeing the, uh, how data collection actually happens, both survey data collection and administrative data collection. So it's a really kind of foundational training that gives you a perspective on how the, what we know, how do we know what we know? How do how do data come into being? It's, I think this is a real bonus to being at Michigan to having this kind of proximity to on the ground data collection across a variety of areas of interest to population scholars, including fertility and family formation. The National Survey for Family Growth, uh, National Survey of Family Growth is um, collected through Michigan. The uh, relationship dynamics and social life study is a new study looking at young women uh, contraceptive and fertility behavior as they make the transition into adulthood. We have, uh, we, do, we have data collection on internal and international migration, particularly with uh, the Chitwan Valley, family, uh, Chitwan Valley study in uh, Nepal. The health and retirement study is administered here, giving students an opportunity to learn firsthand about data collection and topics on retirement, aging, health, and mortality. And then the panel study of income dynamics is also collected here. This is a study that's been running oh, since the late 1960s, following the descendants of the same families to look at, to get a really unique perspective at looking at intergenerational uh, Status attainment and inequality. So all of the uh, so this uh, all of those topics can be addressed both through um, observing primary data collection or working with those data as secondary data sources uh, at, over the course of your career here. In addition, there's a great deal of activity on campus. Look at uh, working with population scholars, working with data scientists, and developing the field of computational so social science. So I feel like we're very much on the cutting edge of those areas. And, in a, and we also have a program in population neuroscience and genetics, really bringing together a population perspective on, how, on uh, how we can use biomarkers to understand demographic behavior, as well as inequalities in health and well-being across the life course. So just to say a little bit about how to apply to the University of Michigan as a population studies scholar, the annual application deadline is next month, it's December 15th. I think as with most graduate programs, you'll need to provide transcripts and GRE scores. The um, public health school will also accept MCAT scores in lieu of GRE scores, and uh, we require three letters of recommendation. And then if you look at each of the academic units I was describing, they have requirements that vary a bit, but for the most part, they each seek a statement of purpose, a personal statement, and a sample of your written work. And there are, are uh, additional requirements, including TOEFL tests for international students. To signal, uh, to, uh, to let the departments you're applying to know that you're interested in population studies and uh, consideration for uh, a traineeship, you can signal your interest in your statement of purpose. In addition, people applying to the sociology department can indicate that they're interested in the social demography field as part of their online application. And once those applications are in, the sociology and the health behavior and health education program in public health will review your application and identify students who, are, who would be a good fit as a PSC trainee and match you to a mentor during the admissions process. So you would come in in your first year knowing that you had been identified as a PSC trainee and that there, you would be eligible for up to three years of funding depending on your progress through the, uh, uh, with coursework and training. And the economics program works a bit differently. There they identify trainees in the third or fourth year of the program. And in economics, all of the uh, first year students receive fellowships. So the, and both economics and sociology guarantee five years of funding. So um, even, so as I said, that uh, in those programs, the PSC traineeship provides three years of funding. 
students are supported through all of their years through other mechanisms and they maintain their trainee affiliation across the course of their time at Michigan. So just to finish up to say a little bit about student life at University of Michigan, I think one of the uh, particularly exciting things happening now is a strong commitment to developing a broad program of diversity, equity, and inclusion across the university for students, faculty, and staff that's really built from the ground up from students and academic units having input in how they want diversity, equity, and inclusion to really be um, institutionalized at Michigan. And uh, so that's been, I think it's been a really exciting process to watch that develop here. And beyond, and beyond the campus climate, there's a great deal that Ann Arbor has to offer. It's a, a beautiful place to live. There's lots of sports. We have to, a lot of cultural activities that pass through. Ann Arbor also just sort of has a quirky college town culture, so it's a fun place to be. And uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions now or in the future if you want to follow up with me to address your questions about Ann Arbor, about Michigan, or about the PSC training model in itself. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Polisani. I uh, always great to see photos of Ann Arbor, especially when I'm not back there. Um, so uh, with that, we will switch over to our last presenter for Professor Wendy Manning of Bowling Green State University's Center for Family and Demographic Research. And I think she's already uh, unmuted. Uh, so uh, go ahead, please, uh, Professor Manning. OK, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to participate in this webinar today. And I just wanted to start uh, by saying that no matter what program students select, these are all excellent. And that as the president-elect of the Population Association of America, I'm just thrilled there's people interested pursuing um, careers in demography. So just want to start with a big plug for demography. Um, at Bowling Green, I thought I would first um, show you uh, where it is. A lot of people think it's in Kentucky. We're in Northwest Ohio, so I've included a little map there. There's about 17,000 students. And uh, we have about 17 doctoral programs, about 2,500 graduate students here at Bowling Green. Um, our demography training occurs within the Department of Sociology. I, uh, we have 20 full-time faculty. We provide intensive training and research as well as teaching. Um, we have four primary areas that we focus on. One is demography, of course. That's why I'm here today. Criminology, social psychology, and family. Um, the areas that you can pursue within demography, you can get a master's in applied demography, a master's in demography or a PhD with a concentration in demography. Um, the master's in applied demography is a slightly different set of coursework and prepares you uh, as a terminal degree to pursue um, programs, um, pursue positions in organizations um, such as the Census Bureau or industry where you could use your demographic skills. We um, have, let's see here, I've, list, I've shown you pictures of the six faculty who are training in specifically in demography. Of course, as our department is um, quite interdisciplinary students, the benefit is you get training across these areas, which I think is really important to get a broad and not just a narrow perspective. And so I've just listed these um, faculty, and many of them you may recognize from their um, publications or even from their um, coverage in the, new, in the news and media such as um, Dr. Susan Brown, uh, who's frequently um, featured in um, places like the New York Times or Chicago Tribune for her work on um, aging families and especially the great, great divorce. We also have Kelly Balistrieri, who does uh, research on health and migration. Karen Guzzo, who's doing uh, research on, on, um, on uh, fertility and unplanned uh, births. In the United States, Kara Joyner, who's done a, a variety of different topics, uh, ranging from methods and techniques to uh, some new work on same-sex uh, couple families. Um, myself, I do uh, a lot of work on family formation and stability of family, as well as complex families. And Laura Sanchez, who's also um, 
a more broad demographer who's doing uh, uh, work on environment, environmental factors, and um, as well as family sociology. So we have, um, as every program has, um, uh, some very fine methodological seminars as well as substantive seminars that are offered on a very regular rotation. Um, these are the sort of hallmarks, I think, of any um, um, de demographic program are the te techniques and statistical coursework as well as those core areas within, um, within our field. Uh, I just listed here some of our currently funded research projects and why you might want to pay attention to that as you're looking at different programs is when people have funded research projects, that means they have more resources and opportunities to train students. You can train students without these specific um, projects as well, um, but this is just one way to showcase some of the work that's going on. Um, so we have uh, Kelly Balistrieri has work on um, the Ohio Medicaid Assessment Survey, so she's involved in a primary data collection. Susan Brown and Ethan Lynn have funding from National Institute of Aging on health and well-being and later divorce and subsequent reparenting. I'm on a project with Peggy Giordano and Monica Longmore where we're following up um, adolescents from Toledo into um, um, starting to be their 30s and we're focusing specifically on questions about parental incarceration and intimate partner violence. Karen Guzzo has a project on unintended fertility uh, funded through the Nash, uh, um, NICHD. We also have projects with, um, I have a project where we're archiving county and state um, marriage uh, and divorce data, There's, um, which is more challenging than you might think. Uh, Kay Namaguchi uh, has a, a current project where she's um, examining parent-child relationship quality and really looking at the work-family interface. And then Ray Swisher with Daniel Kuhl and Jorge Chavaz have a project on neighborhood change and violence in adolescence and emerging adulthood. Something that we're able to offer uh, is that we co-author a lot of papers with students, and so I've just listed a few here in the last couple of years. It's really exciting for us to train students and mentor them through the publication process. We um, support students to go to the Population Association of America. Here's a picture from last year. I think it's a little um, fuzzy, and I've listed here um, all the different um, papers. I think we had about 14 students who were actually um, on the program for the PAA, so that's a great way to showcase um, work that um, they're able to participate in with faculty as well as some sole authored um, work. We have, as um, everyone else has discussed, we have a um, center, we have the Center for Family Demographic Research. Um, similar to other centers, we offer a regular seminar series as well as a a symposia which focuses on a different theme every year. Um, we have also offer the similar kinds of infrastructure support to provide um, computing and statistical um, uh, training at, for students to pursue their um, uh, research projects. Um, something that's a little unique about, oops, about Bowling Green is um, we host a research conference with uh, Ohio State every year. We trade off where it's hosted. So we just had this last week, so that's why these pictures are um, relatively recent. It's our 11th annual, and the students organize the conference, and they give the presentations. We had 13 research presentations and five discussants. So it's a great opportunity for them to try out some of their new ideas and also learn how to take a leadership role in terms of organizing, um, organizing an event and broadening, um, broadening their network. Uh, another center that we have at Bowling Green is the National Center for Family and Marriage Research. This is a more national scope uh, center and tries to support research on um, the health and well-being of children, youth, and families. And um, this also provides opportunities for students in terms of we uh, um, produce a number of family profiles and um, students are often uh, authors and, uh, and leading questions on these profiles. So these are just two that um, just this month came out, but every year we have over 20 profiles, so it provides uh, a great um, mentorship and training experience for those students. 
I realize we're running short on time, so I will just um, end with Demography to the Rescue. That's a picture of our mug. Um, but I feel that this is something that um, I'm excited and proud about, is that I really think demography as a field can help answer important questions um, that have uh, not only are important for academic questions, but also policy and um, uh, applied settings as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Manning. Um, I think we all share uh, the importance of uh, the view that uh, demography is important, especially given where we are today. Um, so I uh, just wanted to, to say that um, we, we share uh, both Professor Manning's uh, view uh, that, that demography is important and to the, to be to the rescue right now. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, uh, I know that we're, we're up against the hour right now, but there are a couple questions, and I understand that some may not be able to, to stay on, but uh, I will pose them then to anybody who is able to stay on. The, the questions that I've seen, for the most part, are not, uh, as far as I can tell, directed at any one particular program. Um, but uh, I'll ask that if you do, uh, if you would, if the panelists would, uh, like to answer into the questions to just go ahead and take themselves off mute. Uh, but the first question I see is um, whether there are any particular undergraduate majors uh, that the programs are looking for. Uh, I think I think there's probably you know, some interest if whether um, the programs are looking specifically for uh, say sociology or demography or sociology or, or economics undergraduates. Uh, are there others um, uh, speaking for for some of the people that we know, um, you know th there are obviously uh, other disciplines that uh, we, we find demographers coming from. Uh, what What is your uh, view on this? Hi, this is Paula. I would say that at Michigan, uh, students applying both to sociology, economics, and public policy come from a variety of backgrounds, and particularly for thinking about uh, population scholarship, I think uh, the more uh, the real strength is what you can say in your um, per statement of purpose and your personal statement about what's motivating you to pursue this discipline in graduate school rather than uh, the academic training that you've had previously. So certainly, you know, if that works to you, as a strength, you go ahead and promote that, but it shouldn't, being trained in some other disciplines shouldn't be considered a kind of barrier or any kind of a liability in your application. This is Jenna. I just echo that our affiliates um, who are PhD students come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some of them have worked uh, in research organizations before coming here. Some haven't at all. Some have master's degrees. Some don't. And really, all that we're looking for is is the same things that any PhD applicant applicant uh, process is looking for: just strong writing skills, strong thinking skills. Great. Um, as long as nobody else uh, would like to jump in, uh, feel free to interrupt uh, otherwise. But uh, we had another question uh, that actually asked about uh, flexibility in, in some of these graduate programs. Uh, there was a question about um, uh, what is the flexibility for the flexibility for those uh, looking at potentially starting families or, or you know, who might be at a slightly different you know, place than uh, somebody coming directly out of undergrad. This is Jenna again. Uh, we have a, a number of our students actually have children while they are in the program, and that's uh, eased somewhat by um, we have subsidized. The University of Wisconsin has subsidized childcare on campus that, that people can get access to. Um, we also we provide funding support for our students for five years, and usually there's some flexibility to. Uh, find a sixth or seventh year if needed to support students who need to take leave for having children or other, any, really any kind of caregiving responsibility. This is Wendy, and I would, ag I would agree with what Jenna said, is that I think most programs um, um, have, fa have students who are um, having children during graduate school, and um, it doesn't seem to, um, there, there remain lots of ways that people can be um, 
and flex can, can be flexible. And also, I think we encourage students to who have worked for a while to also come to graduate school. And uh, we see a lot of those um, students in our program, and they actually um, uh, bring a great a great perspective to um, their their training. And they actually are probably um, uh, quite motivated and successful in this kind of environment. I guess the only thing I'd add to that is, um, you know, I think normatively, several decades ago, it may not have been acceptable to have or to look down upon to have children during grad school. And I think that at least here, I'm sure, at the other centers represented here, that, that has changed. And children and family as part of our well-rounded life um, are, are certainly, you know, celebrated. So I, I, I think for students who are thinking about coming into PhD programs and, and want to have families during PhD programs, um, my view, at least from here, is that that is something that's very much accepted now. All right. Uh, we also had a question about um, whether uh, uh, any particular subject areas are growing. Uh, I think this probably has a little bit to do with uh, some of the, say, the, the research themes or, or some of the areas. Uh, I know that biodemography uh, stuck out to me in, in a, few of, uh, a few of your slides. Um, are there any of these types of areas that you see uh, are, are particularly growing at your centers that you might be accepting uh, more students uh, uh, in the coming years? This is Paula. So yeah, I would uh, echo that, that bio, I think biodemography is an area of emphasis at Michigan. And so this is both looking at gene environment interactions as well as epigenetics, which is a question about how the environment influences the expression of genes over the life course and, and potentially contributes to health inequalities by social class or race ethnicity. So I think that's, a develop that's an area that um, NIH is particularly interested in seeing more research uh, coming out of. Um, in addition, I think aging continues to be an area of emphasis in training. So the uh, aspects of tr um, aging, including uh, labor uh, retirement or remaining in the labor force for a longer period, uh, looking also at uh, Health decline over the life over the life course. Uh, there's increasing funding support for research on Alzheimer's and social disparities and um, and Alzheimer's onset and experience with Alzheimer's. So those are some of the areas I've seen uh, a lot of growth in recently. This is Matt Hall, um, and I, I just want to again echo. Um, kind of the gr growing interest in biodemography, and, and some of that's happening here at Cornell as well. Um, computational demography or computational sociology is also kind of a, um, an area of focus here that's trying to bring together perspectives from kind of network analysis and network science um, into demographic approaches to kind of uh, to, to either doing data mining or trying to detect patterns that are otherwise difficult to to, um, to, to assess, so uh, uh, that, that, that's another area of kind of emphasis that, um, that Cornell is embarking on. I can say um, in terms of the Population Association of America that the, great, the greatest increase in, in submissions to the conference was actually in um, aging, so I thought that was um, a new development that um, hadn't been um, occurring in the past. And the largest section, um, the largest topic area that received papers uh, was in health, health demography, as well as um, uh, issues related to uh, reproduction and fertility. Uh, I see that we also have uh, a couple questions that, that kind of um, relate specifically to Africa. And, and th there are kind of two parts to this. One is uh, what are the options um, for students who may have earned a master's degree in population studies from the university from a university in Africa who are interested in pursuing a PhD uh, at, at one of your programs um, uh, what uh, what are the options for, for those coming internationally with uh, with existing masters in uh, population studies or, or demography and, and the second uh, second part of that question is um, uh, are there programs or do any of your programs uh, focus on uh, Africa as a region um, and 
for population studies. So this is Jenna. Uh, I would say probably somewhere between a third and a, to a half of our students uh, come in with training from international institutions, and this includes East Asia, Southeast Asia, different parts of Africa. Um, we have a number of scholars who focus on various demographic questions outside of the U.S. One of them is Monica Grant, who has ongoing data collection uh, in Malawi. There are, and so several of her students um, work with her on that. We have a current PhD student who's collecting uh, data in Nairobi right now for the next six months. Um, so it's, it is absolutely possible to come in with a background from an institution outside of the U.S. and uh, those applications are typically reviewed in exactly the same way as other applications coming in from uh, students with training in the U.S. And then uh, I, I would imagine that most of the other centers represented in these webinars have scholars on campus who have expertise and have ongoing data collection efforts in various parts of, of Africa. Um, the expertise here is, is more clustered in sub-Saharan Africa. I, I I'll add just one, one little uh, tidbit about uh, the University of Michigan, the Population Study Center. Uh, we've actually had a couple researchers in the past who've had um, uh, pretty strong ties to, to the University of Cape Town in South Africa, for example, uh, and um, ongoing relationships with uh, with researchers there, both uh, for data collection and, and analysis. And so um, I, I think that for what I can say about, um, uh, about that, uh, it, it certainly is um, uh, an area of, of interest or, or it has been in the past. Uh, but I think those are all the questions, uh, all the questions we have. Uh, I would just like to um, thank all of the, the panelists uh, today for, uh, for everything, uh, for all the preparation <laughs> and, and, and for answering all of the, uh, all of the questions. Um, uh, for those of you who participating who may be interested in, uh, in our future webinar in about uh, a week and a half, we have uh, three other population uh, or demography programs um, who will be presenting. Uh, I'd also like to uh, let you know that this, uh, this session has been recorded and we will provide um, the video of the recording up on the TIPS uh, website in, in about a, in a, in a few days. Uh, so you'll be able to find that webinar or this webinar there uh, at pips.ssdan.net. Uh, I'd also like to uh, suggest that if you're interested in any of the programs today, they all have uh, program profile pages on the PIPS website. Uh, you can find you know, much of the information that they may have presented um, and, and links to their, uh, their individual programs as well. I think with that, uh, I would just like to say thank you one more time to all of the panelists and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.